Good evening. We're so happy to have you all here this evening. And to start us off, we're very pleased and grateful to have Elder Larry Grant from the Musqueam Nation to give us a warm welcome and a land acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I say thank you to everyone uh, for having me here this evening to do the land acknowledgement where the University of British Columbia Vancouver campus is situated upon. I'm Larry Grant. Sayyidluk is my Muslim name, and I'm descendant of Kriyapalana, the warrior that was here to greet the first ship to arrive under Captain Narvez, the Spaniard, and also Captain George Vancouver, the Englishman. And as our ancestors had done in the past, I do today and raise my hands in welcome to all of you here at on the traditional ancestral unceded lands of the Huntkaminum speaking Muslim people. The lands that have been arbitrarily occupied by the Crown of England, the Crown of Canada, and the Crown of the Province of British Columbia, and also the lands that the University of British Columbia occupies. These are lands that have never been sold, never been given up, never been given away and have no agreement of occupation that is beneficial to the first peoples of this land. But it's uh, something that we have been struggling with very ever since the beginning of colonization. And it's just something that we need to have clearly stated to the world when we say unceded lands. So this is an important part of the land acknowledgement. But it's really, really something too that we are here discussing sustainability and climate change issues that are here affecting the world, clean around the world. Several years ago, well, closer to 10 years from today, I, I was on a group that went to the Cook Islands and it was to do about climate change. And they were doing a, a world uh, tour. And several years after coming back, we were informed that one of the islands there when the tide was up at the airport that that island had was under several inches of water at high tide already from the climate change that was happening. And that little group that we traveled with ended up in a Halloween in Nunavut. And the elders up there were discussing how warm the winters were getting. Instead of minus 40, it was only minus 20, but it was getting quite warm. And uh, they were discussing different issues that were making quite a huge change because of the climate change issues that were happening. And uh, they were asking for assistance and or, or just for us as the people of this world to be taking care of things that would help to slow it down a bit. So just wanted to bring that out this evening. It's been ongoing for many, many years now. 
but it's, it's getting to the point where it's, where it's highly critical that we do something. So leave it at that. Collect once it's here taller to move all up to enamel to know where height comes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back to it. Okay. 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 Thank you so much for the welcome and the heartfelt land acknowledgement. We really appreciate it. UBC is grateful to be on Musqueam land here. So I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this event, What's at Stake at COP26. It's a real pleasure. And there's huge interest in this issue. We've had over a thousand registrants. So you can tell everybody deeply cares about this issue that's affecting us all. We're really grateful for our to our co-sponsors, the Sierra Club of BC and West Coast Environmental Law. And I'm just gonna say a few words before turning it over to our wonderful speakers. I'm gonna talk just very briefly about UBC's leadership on climate and then talk about the big picture about what's at stake. So UBC is a leader in climate action. In 2019, the university de declared a climate emergency and the words of the climate emergency are strong and worth reading. And I recommend that you read them. The university commits to addressing the climate crisis. It's critical for the university's key functions of research, learning and engagement. It's critical to prepare students for the future. As a public institution, we have a mandate to engage beyond our institutional boundaries. And the declaration also embeds climate justice across all UBC's policies and plans, a big undertaking, recognizing that climate change has the biggest impact on those who did the least to cause it. So it's quite a remarkable document. We also have an upcoming climate action plan with aggressive new targets and a new scope that will, for the first time, include extended emissions, things like food choices and commuting and business travel. So that will be coming up later this fall. We also have the Climate Emergency Task Force report, which is very wide ranging as well and affects all aspects of UBC's academic operation and community engagement. I think we're all proud that UBC has taken such a leadership role and we all recognize that there's a long way to go still and we'll keep working at it. So what's at stake here? What are we talking about? Why did we bring these great speakers to you tonight? Well, there's a lot at stake. What does the future hold? What will COP bring? What will the glo global leaders do? Will they do the right thing? That's what we're gonna hear about from four people who are deeply embedded in science, law, politics, and activism. It's a great lineup. And I'm just gonna say that what's at stake, I think we all know, I know you're gonna hear more about it um, as we go along, but this summer climate change became very real for all of us. The heat dome, was a shocking event causing death, emergency room visits, overcrowded hospitals, big impact on nature, marine wildlife die off, and the incredibly high and un unimaginable temperatures went so far as to cause the loss of a whole town, Lytton, BC burned. So climate change became really real to us. And it's real for everyone around the world. And the scientists have been telling that for years and years with deafening alarm calls that I hope we'll, we're going to respond to. The latest report from the IPCC, the global consensus of scientists just this August was overwhelming. It talked about the unequivocal evidence of irreversible damage that we've already caused and how we really need to act right now. But there still is time to act. 
UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the IPC report a code red for humanity. And that phrase spread like wildfire right around the world. So that's where we are. And it's such a pleasure, just a few days before this global treaty meeting, to have these four wonderful people joining us to talk about it. So I'm just going to let you know how the evening's going to proceed. We have four speakers, and in order they are Andrew Gage, a staff lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law, Rachel White, a scientist and professor here at UBC, Elizabeth May, an elected MP in our federal parliament, and Anjali Apadurai, who's with the Sierra Club of BC and is a campaigner and advocate. Each of those speakers will have 15 minutes to speak. And then we'll open it up for questions for that speaker for five minutes. The questions will be moderated. I'll introduce each speaker as we go along. So without further ado, I'm going to say a few more words about my friend and colleague, Andrew Gage, the first speaker of the evening. Andrew's been an environmental activist for so long and an excellent one. He's one of Canada's leading climate change lawyers. He has a number of academic publications, and he also writes frequently in media and through West Coast's public interest environmental law outlets. The program he leads at West Coast is the Climate Change Program, and it's called Putting Climate Law in Our Hands. And that's what Andrew is doing. Aren't we lucky that he's doing that? Thank you, and over to you, Andrew. Hi, thanks, Linda. Thanks for uh, having me and welcome to everyone. I just gonna wait to work out how to share my screen here. And so uh, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so I'm coming to you from the territory of the Lepungan speaking people in uh, the, the people of the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations on the south end of Vancouver Island. Um, as Linda said, I'm a staff lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law. And also, it turns out that my parents found out about this webinar, even though I didn't tell them. So uh, hi, mom and dad. Um, I'm going to start my story of, of uh, talking about COP26 uh, with a sort of blast back to the past and, and the uh, 29 year, years ago when the world's governments came together and negotiated the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the foundational document that created the COPS. Uh, COPS stands for Conference of the Parties, and it, uh, it involves all of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention coming together to, to carry out the objectives that were defined by that fundamental treaty. In fact, I mean, in many ways, that this original conference could be considered COP0. In the United Nations Framework Convention, um, the governments of the world committed to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere in a level, at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. This is what I looked like, give or take, uh, in 1992. As you can see, I've been pursuing a hair offset system. Um, the, and this is what the world's greenhouse gas emissions looked like uh, on an annual basis in 1992. And this is what happened thereafter. Over half of the greenhouse gases in the global atmosphere today uh, occurred at, were burned and, and entered the world atmosphere after we promised collectively to stabilize them. In 2007, John Holdren, who was a advisor to US President Barack Obama, uh, made this statement, a couple of pieces of terminology here. Uh, it, when we talk about climate policy, mitigation refers to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, the, the fossil fuel pollution and other greenhouse gases that spread a heat trapping blanket uh, across, around our planet. Adaptation refers to preparing our communities for extreme weather and other impacts of climate change so that to protect ourselves and preparing our ecosystems and, and uh, the, the, the other systems we rely on uh, for those types of impacts in order to avoid suffering. And suffering refers to suffering. No technical meaning there, although it has more recently been called loss and damage. Uh, 
So the code here, we basically have three choices in mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We're going to do some of each. The question is what the mix is going to be. So let's talk about those three concepts in the context of an experience that's affected us all, the heat dome. Uh, Linda mentioned, of course. The first, there's no doubt that this event was caused by climate change. Uh, very shortly after it had occurred, a number of scientists from around the world came together and calculated that this is a one in 1,000 year heat event that was 150 times more likely to occur due to climate change and two degrees warmer. It, they basically said it was essentially impossible, but for climate change. And they projected that by 2050, we should expect to see a heat wave like that every five to 10 years. So this is the direct result of a failure to mitigate, of a failure to cut back our emissions. And as a result, and we need to ask ourselves, are we ready for heat warming? We need to ask ourselves how to adapt. Uh, adaptation has a cost, but in general, it saves money. If it's done well, you can expect, depending on the study and the particular adaptation measure, to save anywhere from uh, 6 to $60 for every $1 spent, depending on yeah, and a lot of variation there, obviously. Uh, and then there's suffering, the loss and damage that, that we experienced. We had the the 769 deaths, according to the uh, BC Coroner Service. Uh, we and CAPE calculated there was probably 10 times that in terms of injuries, fairly serious, you know, ranging from relatively minor to fairly serious. Uh, on a personal note, uh, one of our colleagues came very close to dying during heat uh, the, heat, the heat dome and uh, suffered a, um, a brain-related injury as a result, or heat-related brain injury as a result of the heat. Um, but at the same time, it's important to highlight that there's a difference between, there's a relationship between the adaptation uh, and that loss and damage and suffering. Um, Metro Vancouver, sorry, Vancouver and the Fraser Health led the province in terms of the number of deaths per capita. Whereas the uh, interior health region, which actually had higher temperatures, had fewer deaths per capita. And this is, in, at least to some degree, because that region is much more accustomed to, to higher heat, has in place measures and the knowledge needed to keep themselves safe. Interestingly, Washington state has a significantly lower number of deaths altogether. And I don't mean to diminish the importance of the deaths and injuries, but I think we haven't even really begun to calculate the economic losses that BC suffered. And that's another type of loss and damage as well as the actual losses of life. Uh, but it's likely within the hundreds of millions. And if we experience these types of, uh, of impacts and losses and da damage, uh, you know, as a country that actually has resources to respond and has uh, you know, the, the money to buy the infrastructure needed and, and prepare ourselves, think of how much more so for those countries around the world uh, that are suffering climate impacts but have less uh, infrastructure or are in more climate vulnerable regions. Um, the top picture is flooding in Indonesia. The bottom picture is a drought in Kenya. And those are just a few of the, the worsening types of impacts that are expected from climate change. Uh, you know, some of which we can protect ourselves from if we're on top of the adaptation, but many of which are going to have very real impacts on people's lives, on the economies, uh, both here and in uh, countries around the world. Uh, and they are getting worse. Surprisingly, discussions about the harm caused by climate change really were kept largely out of the international negotiations for the first number of years of the, the COPs that were held. However, they, they really came forward in a big way uh, in COP19 um, when the developing countries walked out of the negotiations because the developed countries refused to talk about loss and damage. Um, and they recognized how important this was to have the resources to, to help their people when their harm occurs to make sure they could get back up on their feet. Um, the result of that uh, was that the developed countries uh, eventually did, did agree to talk about the issues. The, the, the negotiators all came back to the table and they developed a, the Warsaw loss and damages mechanism. Didn't have a lot of details yet or teeth. Um, there was more details to be negotiated later, but for the first time, loss and damage had a home uh, in the international negotiations. Uh, the, uh, 
the details most began to be fleshed out uh, at the Paris climate uh, talks in 2015. You know, in addition to myself up on this uh, slide, my colleague, Anjali, uh, or co-panelist -co Anjali, who was uh, there with West Coast Environmental Law as well at the time. Um, and I'm grateful to her for having helped me through uh, learning how, you know, finding my feet at the one and only COP that I've ever actually attended. Um, so thanks for that, Anjali. This was the first COP after um, Justin Trudeau was elected uh, as Canada's prime minister in 2015. And he was telling the world that Canada was back. Uh, but while Canada did play, I think, a constructive role in uh, getting human rights uh, mentioned in the agreement and in um, helping broker a compromise around uh, the importance of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the um, Canada worked behind the scenes to block uh, discussion about compensation for developing nations and uh, nations that were harmed by climate change. And this was actually quite disillusioning for me at the time. Uh, the agreement did actually eventually come to an agreement on loss and damage in, in Article 8 of the Paris Agreement uh, that committed parties to, um, to enhance understanding, action, and support issues in relation to loss and damage. However, in a separate decision of the parties, they clarified that Article 8 did not provide any basis for liability or compensation. Now, this is, uh, I think, important because I mean, one of the lessons I really took home from, from COP21 from uh, was the fundamental unfairness of how climate policy usually works. On the one hand, we have people who benefit from the fossil fuel economy. In the context of COP, that's uh, you know, the oil producing uh, and burning countries that, that benefit financially, uh, but produce an outsource, an outsized amount of the, the greenhouse gas emissions. And they're the countries that need to cut back on, the, on their emissions. Um, but they also are the countries that have uh, a financial incentive to drag their feet. And entirely, you know, largely separate, or in many, many cases separate from that, are the countries that uh, suffer the impacts of climate change, the climate vulnerable countries, and the way the, the climate negotiations work, they all have to agree uh, on what's going forward. And so you've got one set of parties that really isn't paying the full costs of the, their actions that uh, have every incentive to drag their feet a little bit. Now, what compensation, uh, whether it's through a loss and damage mechanism or some other means, uh, accomplishes it is it actually brings that, those two perspectives together and makes sure that the companies that benefit financially are actually paying some of the costs. And, and that's, I think, really important uh, in terms of, of developing a world that's actually going to move forward on climate change. Now, for COP26, the, the um, conference of the parties that we're looking forward to in Ga Ga Glasgow, um, many, many develop, developing countries have made it clear that they want to put that issue of compensation back on the agenda. Uh, and they are going there uh, with the intention of making that a major issue in the climate negotiations. So watch for that through the, through the talks. Um, it's, it's For many of these nations, it's an existential issue. I mean, you literally have countries that have to bear the cost of relocating their entire population. Um, and you know, I really hope that they're successful in getting those issues back on the, the panel. On the other hand, you, you do have a system where developed countries have to agree uh, and they have a very strong incentive not to agree to compensation. We've already seen, uh, you may have recall hearing in recent days that um, developing, developed countries did not deliver on past commitments to come up with uh, funding to, to climate funding um, internationally. And so it's gonna be a hard sell to get them to agree to an additional set of, of financial requirements and commitments. So I came home from uh, COP convinced from the Paris Convention or is your conference convinced that we need to find ways to talk about climate costs and compensation here in Canada. Some of that includes just pressing the Canadian government to actually be more open to climate uh, compensation when they go to Glasgow. But another approach is to target the companies and, invest and investors that profit most from fossil fuel pollution in our society. There are just 90 entities uh, mostly cement companies and sorry, fossil fuel companies and, and so to some degree cement companies that are uh, responsible for almost two thirds of human caused greenhouse gases in the global atmosphere today. 
Uh, you can even break that down by company. You know, for example, both Chevron and Exxon are responsible for more than 3% each of the human uh, because greenhouse gas emissions through their operations and their products. So, I mean, those were burnt by other people, but they've probably profited financially from that full, um, the, that, that burning of the fossil fuel fuels. These same companies have known since the 1960s or 70s that their products would cause climate change, uh, including sea level rise and other impacts. And by the 1980s, they had very detailed understandings of the implications of their products and what was being burned. This is an actual ad from 1962. It was is not boasting about causing climate change, um, but it is very ironic. And Exxon um, certainly had uh, scientists publishing on climate science, science even at this time. The because of that whole separation of um, profits and costs, profits and the costs of climate change, these companies chose to lobby against climate action, uh, both at the national and global level. They spread climate information. In many cases, they held patents on technologies, solar technologies, uh, low emission vehicles that they failed to develop. Um, and because they don't didn't um, need to pay compensation, they continue to make many of those cho choices today. And they continue to um, appear hugely profitable, uh, perhaps maybe less so than they did just a few years ago, but nonetheless, hugely profitable to governments and to investors. One way to raise the issue of compensation is through the courts. Um, there are more than a dozen, more than two dozen lawsuits in the US brought by local governments and state governments against fossil fuel companies for causing climate change or for their role in delaying climate action. Uh, there's a lawsuit by a Peruvian farmer on behalf of his community brought in Germany uh, against the German coal company, RWE. Uh, and we're long overdue, we think, for a case here in Canada. The moment a case is filed, fossil fuel companies that are named need to disclose to their sh shareholders and investors that they are at risk of being found liable. They need to start answering questions about what they knew and when. So these cases can have impacts on corporate behavior and investor behavior well before they actually get to trial. And I want to emphasize that they do have a potentially global impact. The law has long recognized uh, lawsuits involving this, uh, actions in two countries where, where pollution occurs in one country and the harm is felt in other, other, another country. Climate change is very much like that. Uh, and certainly under Canadian law, the, the fact that the companies are spread throughout the world and the emissions are spread throughout the world does not prevent Canadians who are harmed by climate change to be suing in Canadian courts. Similar rules, uh, although slightly different country to country, do exist elsewhere. Um, so yeah, it's possible to sue Chevron or Exxon, not just for what they did in Canada, but for their global role in causing emissions. Uh, Canadians, by and large, accept this idea that fossil fuel companies are at least partly to blame for climate change um, and, and should be paying some of the costs. And you know, here's a, a survey we, we fielded in, in BC have found that uh, well, significantly over 60% and uh, believe that fossil fuel companies should be paying a share of the costs of climate change and you know, less than 20% oppose that idea. Uh, hopefully that's big enough people can see. They also, but almost 50% supported suing, uh, like government suing fossil fuel companies to recover a share of the cost of climate change. Andrew, are you yeah, almost? I I am almost, almost done. done. Sorry, okay. I'm pushing my late time. I'm sorry about that. Two no more problem. slides. Uh, the reality is that as long as oil, gas, and coal are seen as profitable, and as long as they don't pay, pay for a share of the costs of climate change, uh, they're good. they're going to. It's going to be very difficult for the decision makers in countries that benefit from those industries uh, to make the huge changes that we need to see. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to suggest that one of the reasons that that emissions trajectory continues to rise is because oil and gas is, continues to be seen as so profitable. But to turn back to the cops, once oil companies, gas companies, and coal companies, and the governments that support them realize that they're going to be held accountable one way or the other, then the, the cops become the best place to deal with that. Um, the, they have an incentive to sit down at the table and figure out ways to deal with loss and damage through the international negotiations rather than on a, government, on a country by country uh, litigation. And we've seen this before. We've seen oil companies that have to pay for oil spills through an international fund rather than having litigation on a country by country basis. The, once the, the compensation is in place, whether through litigation or through international negotiations, 
the countries that have profited from fossil fuels, I think, finally have an incentive to come to the table and negotiate in good faith on how to do that mitigation so we can have less of that adaptation and suffering. So thank you very much for, for listening, for UBC Sustainability, for inviting me to speak, uh, as well as the foundations that have supported my work today. And I look forward to discussion later. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's wonderful. Thanks for that overview uh, and uh, deep dive into some of the issues you've been following for so many years. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions, one or two. Um, we're going to post them to you directly in the chat. So if you can look in the chat and you can see a question sent to you, um, we'll see if, and if you could read it aloud and address it. Sure. Um, what is the aim of all this when top management of oil and gas companies are proud of their money-making process? And according to my experience working with a lot, of, a lot of them, legally, what laws do we have to force companies, I think, to convert? Um, so, I mean, I, I think, I hope I, I, I answered some of that. I certainly intended to. I mean, I think that the, the, the aim of all of this is to actually bring together that uh, separation of the costs, uh, for the profits from the fossil fuel economy and the, uh, the costs ultimately, and to, to get the, the true costs of climate change reflected in the balance sheets of uh, decision makers, investors, companies. Uh, legally, uh, I mean, actually, yeah, clearly, this is going to require some innovation on the part, part of lawyers, but I think not as much as people think. Uh, you know, there's a lot of experience um, with nuisance law, with water law, dealing with pollution that is, I think, relatively transferable to uh, climate change. Uh, we've certainly, um, you know, there was a letter signed by, I think, I'm, I'm not sure of the number off the top of my head, but uh, 30 or more um, law professors from across Canada not uh, that long ago sort of confirming that they saw these types of cases as having merit. Uh, you know, as I say, there, there have been cases brought in the States, which haven't yet gotten to trial on the merits. Uh, but the case in Germany that I mentioned, you know, the German courts have confirmed that there was an arguable case there. So I think there are laws that we can use for this. To the extent they're not, there's also the possibility of amending the law, uh, as we've done with tobacco litigation and opioids litigation, to make it easier to sue these companies. Great. Uh, Thank, thanks so much. I think we're going to just leave it there for the moment. And if there's time at the end, we will come back. But thanks again, Andrew. That was a wonderful overview drawing on your deep experience with these issues. So I'm going to now introduce our next speaker. That is uh, Dr. Rachel White. She's an assistant uh, professor here at the Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Science. Um, her focus is on large scale atmospheric dynamics, and she works with climate models to better understand what's happening with the climate and basically what's at stake. Uh, Rachel uh, was a panelist at a recent research symposium that UBC held among faculty, and we're so pleased she could join us tonight to talk about this really important issue about the thresholds. How much warming can the world stand? What is the difference between what doesn't sound like a big deal, half a degree, but really, why does it matter? Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Linda. Um, yes, and thanks to the UBC Sustainability Initiative for inviting me to speak here. Um, so yes, as Linda just said, maybe 1.5 and 2 degrees C doesn't seem like a big difference. And so I've sort of shown this on this first plot here where we've got maps of simulated change where we have 1.5 degrees global warming on the left and 2 degrees global warming on the right. And so you can see, obviously, things get a bit hotter as we move towards the higher temperatures. But I'm going to really sort of dig into why that is. And so why are we talking about 1.5 and 2 degrees? Um, and so uh, Andrew was talking about the, the Paris Agreement. And here's just one of the statements that came out of that COP in 2015, which was that we're, we have a goal of limiting global temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to limit that increase to 1.5. And so I thought I'd just sort of start with a, well, where are we now? And so here's just sort of a graph showing temperatures for the last 2000 years. And so for the last sort of 150, we've been observing them relatively directly. And then we've reconstructed from various paleo records, um, things uh, around the globe that record the temperature. And so we can see some, from sort of year one on the left through to year 2020, actually now 
we've seen about 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming relative to these pre-industrial times of sort of 1850. And we're now getting into the warmest multi-century period in more than 100,000 years. And so it's interesting to think about, we're talking about this X degrees of warming. So 1.5 degrees of warming or two degrees of warming. And it's interesting to think about what that actually means. And so here we've got a map, and this is from the latest IPCC um, AR6 report that shows what warming looks like around the world observed for a one degree change in global warming. And so even though we've got one degree of global warming, what we actually see is that we have more warming, darker colors towards the polar regions, particularly in the Arctic. And so this is this Arctic amplification or polar amplification that's often talked about. And the other key differences are the difference between the ocean and the land. And so the land is warming faster than the oceans for a number of different reasons. And so what does this mean? Well, um, Linda introduced or mentioned this June heat wave. And so obviously as we raise temperatures, um, we're going to get more heat waves and we'll also get fewer cold snaps. Um, and the interesting part is, well, are we also changing some of the dynamics? And so yes, as things get hotter, um, our heat waves will become hotter. But my research really studies how the atmospheric dynamics is affecting these extremes well. As sea level rise, and so as we're warming temperatures, both the ocean is expanding um, and we are melting land ice. It's also um, contributing to sea level rise. And so coastal regions could experience more flooding. Actually, as we warm temperatures, um, I'll show another figure later, we actually see more heavy rainfall. And so there's a very well understood relationship between uh, air temperature and the amount of uh, rain intensity of very heavy rain events. Tropical storms and hurricanes, as we're increasing sea surface temperatures, are increasing in strength. And we've seen a lot of those um, in recent years. And the wildfires that come with heat waves um, and with increased evaporation of water from the land dries out the land. And so we could see more wildfires into the future. And that was, uh, again, we got an example of this here in BC over this summer, but we had this very extreme heat wave and it was followed by a pretty devastating wildfire season. And so it's an interesting question to think of what level of global warming is safe. We have these two targets, either 1.5 or two degrees, um, but how do we decide what's the level of global warming we should aim for? And so here's just uh, observed global temperature to change from um, 1950 through to about 2015. And then after 2015, these are these projections. And again, this is coming from the latest IPCC report. And so these uh, five different projections are different ways we could go um, with different amounts of carbon emissions leading to different amounts of global warming. And so we can sort of see, OK, well, if we follow this um, darkest red one, we're going to reach four degrees or five degrees of warming by the end of the 21st century. And if we follow some of these bluer ones, actually, we can keep it to under this two degrees of warming. And so what does that mean for the various um, things that will impact us? And so we can look at the sea ice area. Um, and so as we're decreasing sea ice, this is changing some of the dynamics that I was talking about, and this might have impacts on our extreme weather, and it also impacts those who live in the Arctic and rely on the sea ice. And so we see that as we increase temperatures, um, as we're going from these blue scenarios to the red ones, we get steadily less and less sea ice into the future. It's also very interesting, people are talking a lot about um, some ocean circulation called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning. Um, and for um, reasons of um, heat transfer and melting of fresh water into particularly the North Atlantic. It appears to be something, there's a lot of discussion about what this actually means, how much of this is natural variability and how much of this is actually being forced by um, this warming, this anthropogenic warming. And so again, we can see that we're, um, the, the slowdown continues into the future. And I've already mentioned this global sea level rise. And so again, as we um, go higher and higher in these emission scenarios, we see more and more sea level rise. And what's interesting is in this, and this was in the latest IPCC report, they included this dashed line, which is a low likelihood but high impact scenario. And so some of the problems are we don't actually know enough about uh, ice sheet stability to know for sure that there's not going to be some catastrophe 
catastrophic instability of these ice sheets under strong warming, leading to collapse of large amounts of the ice sheets and therefore large amounts of warming. And so the thing is, from looking at these graphs, and the, the key point that I want to get across here really is there's not one point, there's not one temperature where global warming becomes really problematic. And there's another temperature where actually it's fine. All of these are pretty gradual increases. And so the hotter it gets, the worse it's going to be. And so that's where aiming for these 1.5, this 1.5 target is better than two degrees. Like, and to be honest, aiming for one degree would be better than 1.5, but we've already exceeded one degree um, with about 1.1 degree of warming already. And so, right, as I was saying, we can think about what level is safe, but really it's just a matter of the hotter it gets, the worse the impacts are going to be. And so again, this is just um, the temperature changes simulated at 1.5 degrees warming, but we can also look into the other um, uh, sort of impacts of climate change. And so we think of sort of global warming, and again, this is emphasizing that, okay, it might be 1.5 degrees globally, but actually in the Arctic, this is somewhat more like four degrees of warming. And so that's, that's it's not just, oh, everywhere gets 1.5 degrees warming, that's not too bad. Even at 1.5, there's big disparities between different parts of the world. We can also look at changes in precipitation. And so this is showing percentage changes in precipitation, so rainfall or snow further towards the poles. And again, on the left, we have 1.5 degree, and on the right, we have two degrees warming. And so the places that are green are projected to get wetter, and the places that are red are projected to get drier. And some of the um, key results here is that places that are already wet are projected to increase and places that are already fairly dry are projected to um, decrease, have decreases in precipitation and therefore get drier. And again, if we look from the left to the right, we just see that largely this is just an amplification of this signal. It just gets worse the more global warming we have. And so Linda gave a, um, uh, a good introduction to the heat waves that we had and Andrew talked about it as well and so really when we think about global warming we can think about this oh 1.5 degrees and accept that that's going to be a bit higher over land that's going to be higher over the poles but it's often really these extreme events that actually have the most impact on human lives on ecosystems and on the economy if that's the thing that we're interested in and so this is um, again from this latest IPCC report looking at a heat wave that occurs one in every 10 years. And so just looking at the hottest event in every 10 years. So it's not the most extreme heat wave, but it's one that you wouldn't see um, many times. And so in the old climate, it was once already, it's now 2.8 times, but at 1.5 Celsius, it would now occur four times in every 10 years. And so it's 4.1 times as likely. And then if we go to two degrees, it's now 5.6 times as likely. And on top of that, and so that's just the frequency, but on top of that, they're also getting hotter. And so we can see that as we are increasing the global warming levels, the intensity increase of these heat waves is also increasing. And so, as I said, this was a, um, a not terribly extreme year, um, or this, that, this is a one in 10 year event. And we can also look at these one in 50 year events. So a really extreme heat wave that most people would only experience once in their lives, or at least in the past climate, they would only experience it once. But at 1.5 degrees, it now occurs nine times. And at two degrees, it would occur about 14 times. And again, the intensity of these events is also increasing. And so there was a really interesting report out here just a uh, month or two ago, looking at um, intergenerational inequities in exposure to climate extremes. And so in this paper, they analyzed a lot of different climate extremes. And I'll show some uh, further. Look, this one is in heat wave exposure. And so what they did is they compared 2020 and said, People born in 1960, this is the baseline um, birth cohort. And then people born in 2020, what's their increase in um, exposure to heat waves? And so oh, 
Oh dear. And hello. hello. There. Are you back? I think so. There. Sorry we lost that. you for just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Just a second. Okay. You're just cool. telling us about the study. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Um Right, and so on the right here, we've got these different birth cohorts, and so maybe you can um, find the year of your birth. Um, apologies if you were born over uh, 60 years ago. Um, and you can see what your exposure multiplication factor is. Um, and so these are for these different um, warming scenarios. So the yellow is 1.5, the orange is 2 degrees Celsius, then actually the red is current pledges. And so pre this um, upcoming COP, um, what current pledges are going to take because they're not aiming for under two degrees. They're not, they're not aiming for 1.5, they're actually over two degrees of warming. And so as you can see, for people born in 2020, they're experiencing somewhere between four to seven times as many heat waves over their lifetime as someone born in 1960. And as I said, there's a strong relationship between warming and heavy precipitation. And so again, this is exactly the same graph and we just see that as we're increasing the amount of global warming, we're increasing um, the frequency of these events and we're increasing their um, intensity. And ironically, the same is true for droughts. And so I just wanted to quickly say something on the origins of this. Is it climate science or is it climate policy? And so the two, this two degrees actually came out of an economist and it was based on what we our best knowledge of how the climate has been for the last 800,000 years. And essentially it was, if we go above two degrees, and to be honest, if we go much more above one degree, um, we're going to be pushing the climate out of um, a climate that it's been for the last 800,000 years. And so we don't really know what that would look like. And so in 1990, they sort of suggested this two degrees should be the maximum, but really, put in this anything beyond one degree might elicit this rapid unpredictable and non-linear responses and so acknowledging that there's nothing necessarily safe about this two degree limit and so i just wanted to add something and i, I sort of suspect elizabeth will talk a bit more about this um, in her talk about why we've ended up with this 1.5 degrees and so um, i think angeli might also touch on this to do with the climate justice but essentially it was the alliance of small island states that were really pushing for 1.5 rather than two degrees. And since then, African nations have joined the call. And I just want to show these last figures from this study, sort of showing why that might be. And so the small island nations are incredibly susceptible to sea level rise. But also if we look at this climate injustice, um, here's a figure for high income countries. And so this is exposure to all of these different types of extreme uh, weather or climate events. And this same age in 2020, this birth cohort. And so two degrees, we see that there is a significant um, increase over that time period. But if we look at low income countries around the world and look at that same two degrees, that is a much higher impact. And so again, the high income countries that have gained the most from burning all of the fossil fuels and putting them into the atmosphere are the ones who are going to pay the smallest price in terms of um, the impacts on um, people, on ecosystems. Uh, and this is a, a map showing the same thing, showing uh, heat waves and exposure, but I think I'm running close to being out of time. So I just wanted to finish with this one of like, where does this leave us? If we're gonna aim for 1.5 Celsius, which is this top line in this table, and this is again from this latest IPCC report. And there's a lot of uncertainties here. So if we want to, uh, for example, a two thirds chance of limiting global warming to this 1.5, we've got, got about 400 gigatons of CO2 left to emit before we're going to exceed that. And here are these gigatons of CO2 for these only this um, limit which requires taking carbon out of the atmosphere towards the end. And so one last thing, well, a recent report looked at um, comparing a few countries um, in terms of gigatons of CO2 equivalent per person per year, and Canada did not come out well.
So I'll leave it there. Apologies for the internet uh, instability. Um, I'm happy to take questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was an uh, amazing uh, view into all those complicated figures. And thank you for taking us through that whirlwind tour. And I think we can all really understand why this is code red for humanity. Um, and also just tying in the climate justice issues, which are so vital. And I, I really appreciated the way you linked that together. Um, very illuminating talk. Again, I think we have time probably for one question and it will be posed to you in the chat. If you can look at the chat, our moderator uh, is going to uh, send you a question in the chat. Uh, yes, so I've got two, so I guess maybe okay. um, I could. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, so the first question is, um, what can I tell us about the impact of deforestation, e.g. clear cutting old growth in British Columbia on climate change? And for sure, that that's an important sort of um, actually source of carbon dioxide and so that's included in these scenarios um, of um, what are our emissions and so by cutting down forests by taking away that sink of co2 that's a human source of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and so right planting trees instead of clearing them would be um, a key part of mitigation and I can quickly address a second question, which is, do you believe that extreme mitigative methods such as cloud whitening or other um, effects will be required at one point in the next 20 years? Um, and so that's that's a really interesting question. And so touches on sort of something that's often referred to as geoengineering. There's lots of ways to do it. And what's interesting is that some of them or yeah, some of them are quite cheap compared to um, the cost of developing new uh, energy um, technologies and drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so I think we, we are really developing this carbon capture and storage and, draw, and learning how to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And to me, that's the best um, method of this sort of geoengineering. Personally, I feel like other geoengineering methods are pretty scary. We don't actually know what they what an impact they will have on the climate okay we could get down to zero net radiative forcing and so we didn't have any global warming but that wouldn't be the same as not having any climate change and so if we add co2 but then do some cloud whitening thing we've changed the climate still and we could still see some pretty devastating effects from that and it would be unclear whether those would be better than just letting climate change continue. But it's it's a really interesting question. That's my opinion. Um, I'm sure other scientists have different opinions about this. Um, and so I, I guess we'll see. But for me, the technology of pulling that carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere, that's the key one to be focusing on, from my opinion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. And thanks for those questions. I know uh, old growth logging is a big uh, on everyone's mind in BC right now, and also the geoengineering carbon capture. So thanks for that. Before moving to our next two speakers, we're just going to have a short, a very short little video to show you about what's at stake at COP. There's a lot of lingo, there's a lot of acronyms. So we're going to play a very short video from Channel 4 in the UK about COP, and then we'll move on with our next two uh, speakers. This is what a 1.2 degree average global temperature increase looks like. And that's where we're at. Carry on as we are, and a three degree catastrophe awaits our species and all others. So, COP26, Glasgow, the first fortnight in November, 30,000 delegates, the biggest diplomatic event the UK's ever staged, arguably the most important humanities ever put on. OK, let's bust some jargon first off, and there's plenty of it. First, the three Cs. The Convention on Climate Change was set up by the UN way back in 1992. And that brings us to our second C. Every year, those countries get together in a conference, the COP, the Conference of Parties. And that, in turn, brings us to the third C for contribution. Each time they get together annually at the COP, each country has to put forward its big ideas, its big promise, its nationally determined contribution, or NDC. Jargon apart, it's actually quite simple. 
we have the majority of the world's leaders coming together in a few weeks to demonstrate that they're serious about dealing with this issue. That's not an opportunity that's going to come back anytime soon. If we can't take this remarkable chance to make real progress, then we've lost the opportunity that is in front of us. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. 2015 history in Paris. The world commits to holding climate change to two, ideally 1.5 degrees by 2050. So Glasgow is the crucial five-year MOT, delayed by a year by COVID. They don't have to agree any new deal. They do have to commit to make Paris work at last. And we are way off track. A lot have actually improved their, their commitments. Um, unfortunately, the UN just put out a report card where they added up all the pledges and said that instead of reaching a situation in 2030 where emissions are almost halved, they're actually going to be 16% higher. Yeah, we should be 45% cut and we're 16% up. Exactly. Crazy. It's a terrible problem. Since that report, though, breakthroughs on methane emissions US money for emerging economies to decarbonize, China stopping investment on all foreign coal power plants. But two more major things have to fall into place in Glasgow. First, the US and China, the biggest polluters, need to agree radical action for the world to follow. Second, China, which burns 50% of the world's coal domestically, has to stop it sooner than promised. So what will happen? What do we need? Well, expect two cops, really, both of them equally weird. The polluter! Inside the main venue, you've got the accredited delegations, official government delegates from all around the world trying to negotiate this legal text. Uh, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, they are literally arguing over the placement of commas and full stops. Outside, you have anybody and everybody who's interested in climate change. Any company, which basically means practically every company now, wants to come and make an announcement about what they're doing. Also, separately, more importantly, it's outside the COP that we're expecting to see big announcements. So this is what that public COP looks like. Stalls, leaders, demos, greenwash, hogwash, facts, and definitely Greta. Finding holistic solutions is what the COP should be all about. But instead, it seems to have turned into some kind of opportunity for countries to negotiate loopholes and to avoid raising their ambition. Countries have come together and decided on their trajectory and committed to dealing with this issue in 2015. Now what we need to see is the ambition, the innovation and the investment to back that up. Some of that comes from negotiators, but honestly, most of it comes from heads of state making new commitments, leaders of major multilateral banks, CEOs of big companies, mayors of major cities, all of those players coming forward, demonstrating their commitment, reaffirming what they're going to do, showing how far they've come, those are a big part of what is going to make COP a success. All that to finalise rules to keep our world heating within 1.5 degrees and pay poor countries to get there too. 195 countries trying to find common ground between completely different points of view. Small islands that are going to go underwater at two degrees and heavily industrialised countries whose exports are completely dependent on selling fossil fuels. And those two different entities have to find common ground and agreement that they can both live with. That's really hard. So a flawed, imperfect system for sure. But at global government level, it is all we have and all they have. Okay, well, that was just to give you an overview of what we're talking about here. And now uh, we're moving on to our next speaker. And I'm so pleased and honored that Elizabeth May has joined us. I think she's well known to everybody, uh, the first elected Green Party MP in Canada. And congratulations on your recent, I believe, third election uh, for Saanich Gulf Islands. Uh, Elizabeth is one of Canada's best known environmentalists, also a lawyer, former director of the Sierra Club of Canada, 
Um, she's an author of, of many oh. books, uh, an award winner, um, <laughs> on and on. And also a friend and someone I've known and admired for many, many years. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for taking time. Both Elizabeth and Angela are heading off to COP, and it's just so great to have you here before you go sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Well, thank you, Linda. And I, uh, I really want to start by thanking Andrew and Rachel for such excellent presentations. I don't have, I'm not gonna scare, share my screen. I don't have slides for you. I hope in the 15 minutes I have to try to convey something of um, a chronology, a narrative, some storytelling that starts for me. I mean, I guess it starts for me in 1986 when I started learning my climate science as senior policy advisor to the Federal Minister of Environment. So I learned climate science from Environment Canada scientists when we had really good Environment Canada scientists and before the myth of doubt was invented. So I go back, I actually helped negotiate the Montreal Protocol on ozone. And I want to start there just briefly to say, we know how to negotiate global treaties to save the world that work. And we have been denied every tool that worked to save the, the ozone layer when it comes to climate. So I want to flag that because 1987 and negotiating the Montreal Protocol was a long time ago. And people tend not to know that back then, before the ascendancy of world trade and the uh, and multinational corporate rule, negotiators protecting the ozone layer were allowed to have meaningful penalties in the treaty. And if any party to the Montreal Protocol violated its terms and started manufacturing or using ozone depleting substances, every other country in the treaty, which was every other country on earth, could bring trade sanctions against them. Fast forward to 10 years in Kyoto in 1997, we weren't allowed to use any tools for enforcement. And I don't think it's a small thing. And I don't think it's a small reason that every agreement since 92 has fallen short. And in fact, as some of those graphs have, that you've seen in the last uh, hour have shown you, we've moved in the wrong direction. It's not just that we fall short of hitting a target, we move away from the target. And that's when I say we, I mean Canada, but globally as well, as Andrew made the point very clearly, that between 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio and now, we have emitted more greenhouse gases and burned more fossil fuels than between the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and when we pledged to avoid uh, disastrous climate change. So we go back to Andrew's slide on 1992. I don't have a picture of myself there, but you can picture me much younger, but holding an infant daughter who was not yet one. She is now 30. So my sense of time gone by and my enormous rage, rage at the fact that governments, one after the other, after the other all around the world, have kicked it down the road and procrastinated to where my daughter's generation, and, and, and I really appreciated Rachel's use of the slide to show where you are on an age graph of how much impact you're going to get from this. We could have avoided retreating glaciers. We could have avoided a melting Arctic. These things were in our grasp because, as Andrew pointed out, the language of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change said that we were going to strive to avoid, quote unquote, dangerous anth anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Well, we've obviously failed. We have, we, have, we have blown way past dangerous. And we fast forward through Kyoto, which I mentioned in 97, with no enforcement mechanisms and expressed as percentage reductions. By the way, the Kyoto Protocol was entirely modeled on the architecture of the successful Montreal Protocol on ozone, but for the inclusion of penalty measures. So the concept of common but differentiated responsibilities, industrialized wealthy countries go first, the developing world will follow, all of that was laid out and worked to protect the ozone layer. Let's go through Kyoto's failure, which had a lot to do with the Bush administration, and then Canada, you know, we, we're, we're a mid-level power, we talk about how we punch above our weight, we punch above our weight when we do a good thing, and we did many good things at Rio at the Earth Summit. We also punch above our weight when Stephen Harper is prime minister and sabotages a lot of global climate action, particularly by, by upending what was everyone's understanding of a common base year, that everyone, all countries around the world would work to 1990 levels so that you could compare targets. Canada was the first to say, eh, not so much. We're we, we've ratified Kyoto, but we're going to ignore our Kyoto target. We're going to put in place a new one. 
and it's going to be 20% reductions against 2006 levels by 2020. That really did do serious damage to our global architecture. We then had the next target being that we're going to get an agreement. God help us, we got to do it by COP15. Must get there in Copenhagen in 2009. Now, in 2009 was uh, a, the nadir of multilateral negotiations in terms of respect, using the COP as the place where things really happened. In Copenhagen, it was kind of um, a small insider group of industrialized countries meeting in a hotel somewhere, bypassing the normal process on the floor of a UN convention uh, to come up with uh, um, an insider deal called the Copenhagen Agreement. Now, it was a despicable agreement. But that was really where 1.5 came to the fore. And I really appreciated the tracing of 1.5 in Rachel's slides. 1.5 is about trying to hold on to something that while not safe, gives us a prayer to hang on to human civilization. Because when you look at 1.5 or two, you have to remember that failing to hit one doesn't mean you stop at the next one out. If your momentum continues to go the wrong way, you don't stop at two, you don't stop at three, you don't stop at four, and you're perilously near tipping points that scientists can't tell us where they are, where you end up in what sometimes gets called hothouse earth, used to be called uh, runaway global warming, levels of unstoppable self-accelerating global warming brought about by positive feedback loops. That begins to go into Rachel's slides of um, non-linear uh, perturbations, sudden shocks that exceed this notion that we're somehow climbing up gradually. Uh, we're in a perilous place now at 1.1 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase. 1.5 is not safe, but we have to hang on to it. Now in Copenhagen, there was another significant thing that happened and I just want to flag it because in terms of the world and an unequal world north-south, if you go back to 1972, and the first UN conference on the human environment, the developing world boycotted. They said this environmental stuff, this pollution, those are rich country issues. We don't care, we can't feed ourselves. So one of the only developing country leaders who went to Stockholm in 72 was Indira Gandhi. Most of the developing world boycotted, which is why it was a really big deal that in 1992 at the Earth Summit, Brazil that had boycotted two decades earlier, hosted. And that so-called Rio bargain was, this is about equity, development, and environment together. We've never kept our word on that as the industrial wor industrialized world, not at all. But what happened in Copenhagen, which was interesting, was for the first time we saw an alliance at, that, that straddled industrialized countries and the global south. And it was an alliance between NGOs and youth from around the world and the, and the global south. Because in Copenhagen, the entire continent of Africa, every delegation and the low-lying island states stood up as one, walked out chanting 1.5 to stay alive. That's still what I'm chanting in my head all the time, 1.5 to stay alive. We left Copenhagen with a lousy fake deal. It was Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, who stood up and said, okay, sorry, developing world. She didn't quite say sorry. We're not going to cut our emissions in the United States the way you'd like us to, but we're going to give you, if you can't get behind door number one, behind door number two, we've got for you $100 billion a year, and we'll give it to you by 2020. Jonathan Wilkinson just presided over uh, the announcement of failure, which he said was, as ever, when Jonathan Wilkinson announces failure, he says it's good news. Uh, we're going to get to $100 billion a year for Global South and assistance by 2023. Never mind. That was Copenhagen, and it was a train wreck, and it nearly killed the multilateral uh, negotiating system for environmental treaties. Rescued by the woman who's currently this head of the secretariat at the UNFCCC, um, uh, Patricia Espinosa. She saved the Mexican Minister for Foreign Affairs the next year. Fast forward to Paris, 2015. You've heard it. Canada's back. It's, we. Trudeau didn't mention that Canada was back with the same targets that Harper had, and we wouldn't change them till this year. Yeah. So we're now Paris, and the agreement in Paris was hugely successful in the context of what Jim Hansen saw coming. James Hansen announced before Paris started, some of you may remember, he said, this is a failure because it's going to say we're aiming for two degrees, and that's too much. So as far below two degrees as possible, and please try for 1.5 degrees. Full credit here 
Dr. Catherine McKenna. She was a recently announced Minister of Environment for Canada. Canada was the first industrialized country to agree with the Global South that 1.5 should be in the treaty. She did that on her own because I know the next day when I went to the Dell meeting and I, we, were, we were very excited to hear her say it, I immediately contacted CBC and Globe and Mail. So her 1.5 from Canada was in the news, but the lead negotiators for Canada didn't know about it the next day when one of the NGOs in the room asked whether Canada was prepared to support 1.5. And it's a longer story there, but we got 1.5 in the treaty and it really mattered. We still have no enforcement mechanisms, right? So what are the enforcement mechanisms for Canada, uh, for any country? It's basically group shaming. It's a global stock take. The first global stock take will be in 2023. It doesn't budge a year just because we missed a year because of COVID. So what's happened since Paris? I'm very concerned that there is a mania for net zero by 2050 as though that holds on to 1.5. It does not. One thing we did in Paris was we had two agreements. There's the Paris Agreement everyone's heard of, but there was a COP21 decision document that said a lot of other things have to happen before 2020. And one of the things they put on the agenda was we need to ask the IPCC, what's the difference between 1.5 and 2? So the slides Rachel showed us of 1.5 world, 2 degree world, was a direct result of negotiators at COP21 saying, what's this really mean for the, the, the living world if we miss 1.5 and end up at two. That was a critical report. And what it said was to have any chance at all of holding on to 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase, globally emissions of carbon dioxide must decrease by 45%. Again, the sliding thing that Harper stuck in there. Now we're talking 2010 levels, but 45% below 2010 levels by 2030 or the window on 1.5 closes and it does not open again. So when I go into an environment committee meeting with an amendment that says it's not enough for Bill C-12 to say our goal is net zero by 2050, we must include the goal that the IPCC says if we don't reduce emissions by about half by 2030, there is no going to 1.5 degrees because we've somehow gotten to net zero by 2050. It's a fraud. Or as Greta Thunberg says, net zero by 2050 is surrender. By the way, my amendment was defeated by all the other parties there except the Bloc Quebecois. So we have a real challenge here because it is all too fashionable to talk about net zero by 2050, cherry picking one part of what the IPCC said without focusing on the fact that everything has to be done this decade. There is no do over in 2035. You've got to do it now. So for me, when I look at what's at stake at COP26, Canada has a big role to play. Yes, China. Yes, India. Yes. But we're a wealthy country. We've made promises. We've moved away from them every time. We're a fossil fuel producing, fossil fuel exporting country. And if we stood up and surprised everybody by saying, guess what? We are going to announce here and now that we're leaving fossil fuels in the ground as much as possible, as fast as possible. We are canceling the Trans Mountain Pipeline. We are banning fracking. We are eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, which by the way, we contribute more public money to fossil fuel subsidies than anybody else. So coming up this week is first the G20. Saturday, Sunday, all the world's leaders, of the well, 20 world leaders will be in Rome for the G20. I really hope there's peer pressure on Justin Trudeau I really hope it begins to get under his skin that people are wondering why Canada has not moved to at least as far as the U.S. administration of Joe Biden to a 50 percent target. Why are we such cowards? Why are we so useless on the world stage? Maybe it'll begin to get to him some peer pressure because that Saturday, Sunday leads right into November 1st, November 2nd, where Glasgow, where COP26 starts with elected heads of government giving speeches and saying, we're stepping up. We know what we said before wasn't good enough. We know the collectivity of every promise by all the countries that are parties to the Paris Agreement doesn't get us to what we promised. And it's not a small promise. It's not a political promise. It's a sacred vow to our own children and our grandchildren not to abandon them to what Tad Homer Dixon now calls, which I think is the best short form for it, uh, you know, a, a post-apocalyptic Mad Max world. I'm not doing that. So is 1.5 safe? No, 
But if we're not chanting 1.5 to stay alive everywhere we go for now until we get the commitments we need, we're not doing our job. Uh, that's my 15 minutes. Thanks, Linda. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That uh, really just puts it in pretty stark terms about what's at stake. And yes, intergenerational equity is I think the term lawyers use, but really it's about keeping it safe and livable for our <laughs> children and grandchildren. Yeah. And, and I, feel, um, I feel very deeply what you just said. So thank you so much. Um, and your, your years of experience and in these negotiations is just so illuminating. Again, uh, I think we have time for a question or two. I know we've been just all the speakers are so wonderful. It's hard to leave time for questions. We, we, uh, we respect your time on this evening. Uh, so if you look in the chat, you'll see a question for you, I believe. Okay, there's an audience question for me about what is preventing us from implementing penalties to countries that don't hold? Okay, like the way, okay, I'll read it aloud because you all can't see it. What is preventing us from implementing penalties to countries that don't hold true to their commitments to climate change mitigation the way we did with the ozone layer depletion? What prevents us is that we didn't put the penalties in the treaty. How can we undo this? We can start by attacking and I mean, you know, in, 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 in negotiation terms, focus on the World Trade Organization Go back to Article 20 of the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades that predates the uh, WTO's creation and the Uruguay Round, and make sure that we start putting in all trade deals and an international trade law and understanding that nothing in our trading regimes shall be allowed to interfere with climate action. I mean, I'm not going to put in the, all the legal words around how we make that, that case. But I mean, I had a very fascinating conversation just the other day on a webinar with, um, not to digress too much, with Vic Buxton, who's a retired Environment Canada uh, guy who's, who actually saved the ozone layer. Yeah, Vic Buxton, still living in Ottawa. That's the guy. If you want to know who to thank, Vic Buxton. Uh, back then, in negotiating the Montreal Protocol, Mustafa Tolba, the United Nations Environment Program Director, and, and Montreal Protocol was negotiated within UNEP, actually called these guys and said, we don't want you putting trade sanctions in that treaty. It would, it would interfere with trade and you're not allowed to protect the ozone layer and interfere with trade. And they said, sorry, you trade guys aren't allowed to interfere with us saving life on earth, so back off. It's interesting to know that they were able to do that then, but the Uruguay round and the ascendancy of neoliberalism took away that chance. We can get it back. We can either renegotiate our climate agreements to say, if you violate your commitments, we're gonna hold you accountable or we're going to say to the trade guys, back off. You don't get to destroy life on earth because you're trying to protect your trade regime. The trade regime isn't real, but a, a livable climate system and a healthy biosphere, that's what matters. Thank you. Um, do we have time for one more? We have time for one more, Elizabeth. Thank you. And sorry, Anjali, but uh, we're all yeah, just enthralled with this conversation. I know I am. <laughs> Well, the next audience question was, at this point, should we be investing our energy in the COPs or in bringing pressure to bear directly on governments and climate, major, climate sorry, outside the COP process via litigation, lobbying, boycotts, divestment, and civil disobedience? To which my answer is yes. Everything, <laughs> all at once. Everything, all at once. Sometimes I think if I'm spending my days in Parliament well, is that a good thing to do or should I go out and get arrested every day? I'm really not sure. But not acting like it's normal, not accepting this, not saying it's too late to hold to 1.5. And by the way, aren't the liberals doing a good job? No. By the way, I love Stephen Gibo. I hope he really lives up to, to the person I know he is. And we actually get real climate success out of, out of Glasgow, out of COP26. So we as Canadians can say, well, my God, I never thought I'd be proud of my own government like I am today. I don't want to score partisan points. I don't want to keep watching all the other parties ignore their promises. I really, really want, I really want Canada to be the one that breaks the log jam by saying, okay, yeah, you know, we're addicted to fossil fuels. You know, we bought a pipeline. That was the stupidest thing we could have ever done. We're really sorry. We're stopping it now. Uh, yeah, we just keep having to, to try everything all at once. <laughs>
every day. Thanks again. That was wonderful. And uh, uh, just so great to hear these uh, stories and uh, wisdom from people who've been there and who really know it deeply. Which brings me to our final speaker of the evening, Anjali Apadurai. So grateful for your time tonight and for the sponsorship of Sierra Club BC, the co-sponsorship of this event, along with West Coast Environmental Law. I was lucky enough to work with Anjali when she was at West Coast Environmental Law with Andrew Gage. Uh, she's a longtime climate activist uh, for such a young person and has been actually talking at COPS for a decade. She gave a speech at COP17 in Durban a decade ago in 2011 that was electrifying and blew people away like Bill McKibben and N Naomi Klein. Um, such an amazing speech. It's online. You can see it. Um, Anjali is an advocate, an, a an activist, a communicator, a musician. Uh, I don't know if you can see your keyboard behind her. <laughs> um, uh, she's uh, recently was uh, a candidate for the NDP in the federal election and came so close to going to Ottawa as part of a group of climate activists. Um, but she uh, st still with us here. She'll be heading off to COP. She's a climate justice campaigner with the Sierra Club of BC and uh, will share with us some of her thoughts on what's at stake. Over to you, Anjali. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to the UBC Sustainability Initiative. This event has been really, um, really, really well done. And I really appreciated you putting that video in, in the middle. Um, I'm not gonna show a lot of slides. I'm just gonna sort of bounce back and forth between a slide here and there and just uh, sort of telling my stories um, from my, my experience in these international negotiations. Um, this is where I got my start in climate activism was, was studying um, these issues uh, at the UNFCCC as we call it. And, um, and so, and thank you so much to the previous three speakers for, for setting it up in such a great way because I can just riff off mostly what you said. Um, so just thinking about what, how to, how to even approach something as complex as, as these COP uh, conferences and the international negotiations. It's so complicated. There are so many ways to think about and approach the issue. Um, and so I'm going to be speaking from what um, my understanding of um, the equity-based approach to, um, to think about the climate talks. Um, so starting with, you know, the baseline that we know what we need is radical and far-reaching change to actually achieve the objectives of the UN Convention. Um, I think it's important to recognize right off the, off the top that there are impacts and irreversible damage inherent in every single scenario out of this problem. And so um, that's why what Rachel spoke to was really great. Um, you know, the difference between 1.5 degrees and two is, is significant. Um, even 1.5 degrees is a political target, not necessarily a scientific one. Um, so starting with that baseline, our umbrella is 1.5 degrees. The, the central tension of the COP is how to split up the remaining atmospheric space that would take us to 1.5 degrees, recognizing that that's the absolute maximum um, and, that, and that any warming up till then is already dangerous and is going to include destruction. So if we collectively globally need to reduce our emissions by 50% relative to our 2005 levels by 2030, then who needs to reduce by how much is the central question of the COP. The concept is that there is an overall pie, which is atmospheric space. And there are many ways to divide that pie. And so you need some underpinning principles to divide it. Um, and those underpinning principles are the equity principles. What determines your fair share of the pie as a country or as a block of countries? So some of these principles are, um, I, I'll, just, I'll just show you. Um, the equity principles, one of them is known as common but differentiated responsibility. Andrew spoke to that one a little bit. Um, there's also historic responsibility and 
we we know that different countries have different historic contributions to the climate crisis. Um, and they are roughly divided. I mean, you've heard this term developed in developing countries um, or global north and global south. Uh, it's, it's not such a binary always. And I can talk about how it's, it's more complicated than that, but, but roughly historical responsibility um, sort of divides the world into pre-industrial uh, revolution and post-industrial revolution. There's also principles such as the right to develop um, the capability to act and equality when it comes to atmospheric space, which can be expressed in equality um, in per capita emissions, for example. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the ways that we can think about how to divide that pie. And um, as Andrew mentioned, the central tension of these talks is that Developed countries and developing countries have very different interests at the table and very different incentives. Um, the, that, that sort of, um, that divide has seen uh, a war over the equity principles and over including them um, in the actual text of the agreement. Um, developed countries have been pushing back against these principles for the past decade, Canada included. Canada has been um, not a great player at these talks um, and has very much followed the steps of the US, uh, of the US has very much backed um, the, the rhetoric of the US and a lot of the proposals of the US. Um, and the US is known as the world's greatest climate villain. Um, so just, uh, you know, quick personal anecdote. I've, I've watched these equity principles being slowly pushed out of the talks for the past decade. And that started for me um, in 2011 in Durban, um, where something happened that that uh, now is known in the climate world as the Great Escape. And that was where um, a coalition of the richest industrialized countries sort of led by the US started a, a, an engineered narrative to undermine the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. And it started with one submission from the US that said, maybe common but differentiated responsibility has evolving applicability. And, um, and then that was accompanied by, um, you know, a, an air game, uh, an engineered air game to sort of shift the spotlight onto China and India. And that's when the very first narrative around China and India being big polluters sort of originated. It started around 2010, 2011 in Durban and, um, and has and has ballooned since then, um, and so we we call 2011 the start of the great escape from the from the equity principles. Um, all right, um, I'm going to speed this along here. So when I say that the interests of the developed and developing countries are fundamentally opposed, it's because um, developing countries are have much more pressing issues related to adaptation, loss and damage, which Andrew spoke to. Loss and damage just being suffering, um, irreversible destruction from climate change that was not um, uh, caused or contributed to by the places that experience it the most. Um, a need for technology, renewable, renewable technology patents especially, and um, a need for financial um, assistance, climate finance. Um, a lot of that climate finance can be expressed through the idea of climate debt. So if there, if if climate change was kickstarted by the industrial revolution, which made some countries wealthy and industrialized, then how much of that is a debt to the developing world currently? Um, so as you can see, there are a lot of frameworks to approach um, each pathway out of the climate crisis. And so that's why the equity principles are so important um, because without them, you just have a free for all. So, I'm going to skip ahead and sort of keep this short because I think you get the idea. Um, we're pretty much falling short in every aspect of what our fair share as Canada should look like. Um, in, I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to show you something that can illustrate this. Um, back to my little, back to my little slide here. So 
this is just an illustration of like how we can think about splitting up that pie of atmospheric space. Um, I just put a couple of different sort of like visualizations of that. So if you think about this blue part as our remaining, as, as the amount of mitigation that the world has to do, these are some pathways for maybe how that could be split up. But this is what I wanna show you. So Canada's fair share, and this is actually an outdated graphic. Um, the numbers are a little bit actually more dire than this. If we're taking a baseline of 2005, Canada's actual fair share in the global community is uh, emissions reductions of 140%, which sounds like the math doesn't add up, but that's because that's including a 60%. 60% of that is our domestic emissions, reducing emissions at home. And the remainder, 80% is our international obligations. And those obligations take the form of climate finance, transferring green technologies to the global south, capacity building, support for loss and damage um, and for adaptation. Those are the things that if we take into account those equity principles of common but differentiated responsibility and historical responsibility, that 80% of international obligation is our, our fair contribution. That amounts to at least 4 billion US dollars a year. Um, and, and as I said, this is actually um, outdated numbers. So uh, there is obviously a major pushback to that. And um, if you look at what the actual fair shares of most developed nations are, there's, there's, no, um, there's, there's not a lot of support and not a lot of actual momentum to get to our fair share. But I think it's important to recognize. Um, I think what I can speak to um, to answer the question of what's at stake at COP is the role of civil society and social movements. And um, you saw in that video that everything outside of the actual negotiations um, is this big bustling sort of convergence of civil society, <clears throat> activist groups, social movements, frontline folks from around the world. And uh, there's a lot of value in that convergence because civil society at the COP um, is so important to push those equity principles and to, to frame the climate issue in terms of equity and in terms of fairness. Um, one example of that was at COP19 in Warsaw, Poland. Um, Andrew, Andrew showed you uh, the photo of developing country negotiators walking out um, of the negotiations. It was, actually, um, it was actually a bunch of civil society and social movement folks from around the world supporting that walkout and, and pushing at the talks for the establishment of a loss and damage mechanism. If that hadn't been such a drum roll coming from groups around the world, we wouldn't have had, um, they, it, we wouldn't have had a mechanism on loss and damage. Problems with that mechanism aside, Social movements have also been responsible for um, the concepts of climate justice, climate debt, um, uh, the idea of carbon budgets, all of these more radical and equity-based ways to think about the climate crisis. Um, that's pressure coming from social movements, particularly in the global south. And so um, they, pay, they play a really, really key role. Um, I thought that I would, um, I thought that I would just show you a couple of, because I know there's a lot of students here and I know there's a lot of people who are gonna be following the talks. I thought I could just show you a couple of websites where you can actually see um, what social movements around the world are demanding from these talks, just to directly answer the question of what's at stake. Uh, this is peoplesdemands.org and this is um, a sort of coalition of hundreds of movements around the world, mostly based across the global south. And um, there's a series of at least 12 demands here that are about avoiding false solutions, placing equity first, and, and, um, and, and advancing a just transition. Um, here are some of the things we talked about in terms of fair shares and, and our international obligations and, and our obligation to support developing countries through climate finance. Um, 
And here's another thing that you should follow um, if you're gonna follow the COP. COP coalition, COP26 coalition is, um, there's a lot of overlap between these two coalitions, but this is, this is a coalition of, of movements and groups from around the world um, that have done a really, really tremendous job of centering equity, of organizing civil society and providing a space for civil society to be really active in these, in these talks. And, um, and have hosted you know, dozens of calls over the past um, two years with groups around the world and um, come up with this list of demands um, for, for actual climate justice, what climate justice would actually look like, including strong language like reparations and redistribution and fair shares. Um, so, so that's definitely something to, to check out and follow. That's cop26coalition.org. So uh, just to close, I guess what's at stake at this COP is for civil society to be open to, uh, open-eyed to the many, many methods of obfuscation and um, eluding and escaping um, that uh, especially developed countries, including Canada, unfortunately, are, are, constantly, are constantly doing um, to avoid our actual fair share, to, to undermine the equity principles that should be embedded within the talks. Um, some of the false solutions that will be on display include net zero. I mean, there was a big, um, there was a there was a big sort of celebration of net zero by 2050, um, and that was that sort of dominated a lot of the climate conversation um, in Canada over the past couple of years. But there are there are so many deep problems with the framing of net zero. Um, for one, that there's simply not enough land on Earth to actually account for all the country and corporate net zero pathways that have been put forward. Um, the burden of net zero offset projects falls disproportionately upon the global south and on indigenous communities in the global south. Um, net zero relies on market mechanisms um, that can um, obscure real climate action, actual real emissions cuts. Um, and so, and, and another false solution that will be sort of paraded through this COP will be um, a focus on nature-based solutions. Um, when you have the world's biggest banks and companies um, uh, celebrating uh, a concept like nature-based solutions, that should be the first red flag that that is a false solution. Um, and then of course, something that's been in the news lately is the lack of supply side regulation. No one is actually mandating um, the managed decline of the fossil fuel industry. No one is actually regulating the production of fossil fuels. And Andrew spoke to that a little bit as well. Um, so that's what's at stake at these COPs. Um, can we stay united enough to be clear-minded about these false solutions, to sidestep them and to center equity in, um, in what we call for? Um, that's the angle that I will be um, going to the COP to advance. Um, you know, uh, a true equity uh, and justice-based way forward is to support um, indigenous frontline land defense. Um, and there's so much of that happening here in BC right now. And we're actually going to the COP in partnership with Nuchatlet Nation on the island who are in the middle of a uh, rights and title case um, against the province right now um, for their homelands on Nootka Island. And I think that's the kind of thing that is a true climate solution. Um, so I think I'll, I will leave it there. Oh, the last thing I will say is um, this isn't being talked about a lot because there's a lot of like pomp and fanfare around the COP, but I think it's also really important to recognize that there are major issues with access and participation at this COP. Um, and that um, also disproportionately falls along the same uh, inequitable lines. Like for example, one third of small island states will not be attending the COP. Um, there's been major pushback, especially from developing countries against holding this COP in person in the first place. And um, this is deeply tied with the issue of 
vaccine apartheid around the world where there's such inequitable access to the vaccine. So there will be participants coming from around the world who have not been vaccinated because um, there, there are so many um, uh, equity issues around access to that vaccine. And so um, the talks, I would go so far as to say are actually hanging on by a thread because there's so much pushback to um, the, the inequitable access and participation. So uh, that's definitely something, something to think about uh, and that will likely affect um, the actual negotiations as well. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Anjali. That was great. We have a very we have a small oh, Linda, in oh, yeah. we have a small in person gathering here, and uh, we have hundreds, if not a thousand, people out there looking. And everyone I know was enthralled by um, your tour of the equity principles and uh, all these issues. And yes, I think we have time for one question. So if you can look at the chat and see one audience question that's been selected by our moderator to answer, um, that would be wonderful. Okay, so the first question is, since our economic system appears to be at the root of a lot of climate issues, what can governments do to move away from profit-driven capitalist economies and move towards more egalitarian, restorative, and localized economies? Wow, that's really like that. <laughs> kind of the million dollar question. How do we move away from capitalism? I mean, I think um, sort of like you've hit on something really important in the question itself, which is that um, climate change and the climate crisis is rooted in um, um, a neoliberal capitalist global economic system. And I think one way to undermine that is one of the things that I talked about, um, which is framing climate change through issues of equity, through issues of debt and development and economic justice, um, because um, that gets to, that sort of links um, the, the failures of capitalism to the climate crisis. And that's the fundamental link to be made. And so I think when we take direction from the social movements of the global South, where climate justice movements have been linked to economic justice movements like, like debt and reparations um, for decades, um, then, we see, then we see that true link being made. So I think, um, uh, I, I don't know what governments can do, but I, I know that that's what we can do is to, 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 to continue to, to make that link. In. And um, yeah, okay. reinforce thank that. You. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I, <laughs> I know we've kept everyone a bit over time here. Um, so maybe if we could just get all the speakers up on the screen. I think we had to lose Elizabeth off to catch a ferry, um, but I just wanted to give a huge thank you to our speakers tonight, uh, giving us their time. Andrew Gage, Anjali Apadurai, Rachel White, and Elizabeth May. Thank you so, so much for what's at stake at COP26. Thanks for joining us. And I just wanna say one final thank you. Um, uh, thanks to the speakers, but uh, thanks to the team here at USI. Thanks to Nadia, John, Pablo, Tim, uh, Jackie. Um, who have I left out? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think uh, a great team has put this event together on short notice. We really wanted to bring you what's at stake right before COP. So thanks to the team for doing that. Thanks to Elder Larry Grant for his warm welcome. And thanks to you, our viewers. Thanks for coming here and listening. Uh, I said at the beginning, UBC is uh, doing a lot on climate and a lot of leadership. One of the goals in the climate emergency is to increase, uh, to create a culture of engagement and advocacy and to increase education on climate. So I think we really hit both those with this event tonight. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Thanks again. And good night. And good luck at COP. <laughs>